Thanks, Courtney. Hello, everyone, fellow CSS enthusiasts. It's pretty cool to be in a room with like 200 something, maybe, CSS enthusiasts. This doesn't happen very much, right? Um, so, my name is Lara. I'm here to talk to you about CSS algorithms. What? So, I hope that you have a little room left in your brains after this long day because we have to answer a very important question once and for all. Is CSS a programming language? Fire emoji. <laughs> this is a hot topic. People get very heated about this. So I first asked this question in March of 2018 on Twitter, of course. So this is when I was researching uh, for the first version of this talk. So I started giving this talk uh, over a year ago. It, can, it debuted at uh, CSSConf EU, and this is kind of the third, the third wave of this content. And I started out asking this question. I was like, hmm, I'm doing all this research about programming languages. I wonder what Twitter thinks about CSS as a programming language. Results are in? No. But it's close. So we have 42% yes, 50% no, 8% I'm not sure. Not a huge data set here of 129 votes in March of 2018. Fast forward to May of 2019, just a couple months ago, asked this question again, and I was like, oh yeah, everybody's been watching my talk, they know, like, no. 53% 50, no this time. A lot more votes, 5,300 votes. This is for sure the most activity I've had on a tweet. So, it's so really interesting, the comments on this thread. So, I mean, Twitter, first of all, like we know what that's about. But they were so split. So a lot of them are like, yes, of course CSS is a programming language. Absolutely. And other ones were like, no, I don't really consider CSS programming. Or you can't call styling a web page programming. Or stop talking about this. Because <laughs> people get mad and it's just like, we don't need to be talking about this anymore. So I'm like, stop. One moment here, like, what's happening? What is a programming language? There is an answer to this question. There are fields and fields of research about this question. And it boils down to a formal language for instructing a computer to perform tasks. Because the world of programming languages is so big, you cannot have a very specific definition of what a programming language is. And kind of one step after looking over for the definition of programming language, one would encounter programming paradigms. And Oliver's talk kind of primed us for this a little bit. So we have two main programming paradigms, imperative and declarative. So imperative programming, um, you're instructing a computer how to do something. And in declarative programming, you're instructing a computer what to do. And the main difference here in terms of a language is the presence or absence of control flow. And control flow is the ability to manipulate the order of execution of statements in a program. So any computer will read a program top to bottom. And in an imperative language, the order of that execution uh, can be manip manipulated through control structures, so for loops, if statements, et cetera. And in a declarative language, we do not have that control flow. You just say what. So any logic needs to be baked into the statement itself. What are some programming languages <laughs> that fall under these categories? So imperative languages are what we usually think of when it comes to programming languages. JavaScript, Ruby, C++, Python, et cetera. These are often general purpose programming languages, meaning they can serve a multitude of, uh, of different contexts and domains. Declarative languages, on the other hand, are not always, but often domain specific. So they're built to function within a certain context. What are some domain specific declarative programming languages? I wonder. SQL. <laughs> A domain-specific declarative programming language for databases. HTML, a programming language for adding meaning around content on a web page. And of course, CSS is a programming language you use to style that content on a web page. So CSS is a domain-specific declarative programming language. 100%. <laughs> this is the answer to the question. CSS developers program the layout of web pages. Let's be honest, boxes. <laughs> Everything is a box. We program boxes. Also 100%. <sighs> OK, so glad we got that out of the way. OK, so what? Like, who cares? 
well, who cares what we call CSS? Like, I write CSS, I'm good at it, I have a job. Like, why are we having this meta argument about what it is? So the thing is, I'd like to tell you about something called turd-driven development. <laughs> Follow this nice little illustration of a turd. Of course, this is a riff on test-driven development. And part of test-driven development is the assumption that all code is crap the first time you write it. It's like, no matter what, what amazing level of programmer you are, if you're a human being, any code you write the first time is going to be crap. So instead of writing code first, you write a failing test first. That's describing what your code's going to do. So in CSS, we don't really have testing like this at the moment. So our test is kind of the design. So you think like, OK, this is my you know, designer gave this to me. I'm going to write code to make this thing pass. I run the test with my eyes. So we write some CSS to make the test pass. And poop, first time we wrote the code. Then we just stop. <laughs> And we wait for a while. And then, oh, the test is failing. There's a new feature. So we need to write some more code. So we write more code. Test is passing. Oh, maybe there's a regression. Test is failing. We write more CSS, get it to pass. And then, OK, cool. It's, everything's good. We're fine. I'm going to go work on all the other million things I have to do. And then, oh, new feature. Test is failing again. So I write more CSS and so on, until our test kind of like never fully passes anymore, because what's happening to our CSS code base? We're just writing more and more poop, throwing it in there. So like, ah, oh, this is so bad. <laughs> and this is really bad, because this is the web. This is the front end of our applications. This is what people are using. And this, of course, Turd-driven development doesn't only apply to how we handle CSS, but it's often the way we handle CSS. Not good. So what do we do? Ugh. <laughs> That's so bad. That's so bad. What do we do? Stop writing CSS. <laughs> Start programming. <laughs> so the thing is, programming does not equal logic, math, science, engineering. Of course, these things are part of the grand scope of programming. But programming, the act of programming, equals writing instructions for computers that other developers are able to read and maintain. And I think if anything shows that CSS is a programming language, it's that naming is really hard and extremely important. It's one of the hardest things in computer science. Like everybody, any, any computer scientist, programmer, whatever qualification will tell you this. Oh, OK. I know, it's a lot. Let's switch gears a little bit, talk about algorithms. Now that we know CSS is a programming language, any programming language worth its salt better be able to write algorithms. Ah, there's a little monster. OK, another definition. An algorithm, a well-defined computational procedure that takes input and produces output. So this is a definition from Thomas Corman, who wrote a the introduction to algorithms, basically. Uh, that's assigned in many a computer science course. I read the introduction. But it was very good. OK. So an algorithm, this is our definition, another open-ended definition. What are some common algorithms? Sorting algorithms, of course, a great example of an algorithm. So we have an, our input is an unsorted list, and our output is a sorted list. What happens in between? What's our algorithm in between? Name that sorting algorithm. Bubble sort. Selection sort, merge sort, quick sort, and this list could go on. But there's lots of different solutions to this problem. What's an implementation of a sorting algorithm look like? Now, this is for real bonus points if anybody can name this sorting algorithm. Bubble sort, <laughs> which is kind of a joke sorting algorithm because it's not very performant. Um, but this is bubble sort. Imperative JavaScript, we'll give it a heart. JavaScript's cool, we like JavaScript. Um, and if this were declarative code, all we would see is this, the function call. We would not see what algorithm is happening under the surface there. OK, let's go back to our board, back to the drawing board. What about boxes? So what, what kind of algorithm might we write to manipulate boxes? What if I want my boxes to be in a row? What are some algorithms that could accomplish this for us? Hmm, display flex, for sure. Float left, gasp. No, 
Oh, floats out of their place, of course. What does an implementation of one of these algorithms look like? Hmm, well, the part we see, container, display flex, declarative CSS, heart. This is so incredible that we do not have to write the algorithm, that this is the algorithm we write. We don't need to decide how the boxes are laid out exactly. But we need to remember that there is code that does that. So this imperative declarative paradigm when it comes to CSS, we can think about it like an iceberg. Everybody loves a nice iceberg metaphor. Speaking for myself, I guess, but. <laughs> um, so at the top, we have declarative CSS. This is the code that we see. And on the bottom, we have our imperative C++ Rust, the browser source code. Oh my god, so many algorithms down here. What about up here, though? Can we call these algorithms? Display flex, algorithm, question mark? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so this is kind of the, the premise of the, a lot of work I've been doing over the last year. It's getting really interesting to see where this, this topic can go. So let's update our algorithms 101 to CSS algorithms 101. Domain specific, declarative. These are kind of the magic words when it comes to CSS. Because it, like, fundamentally, it means whatever, whatever programming words I'm using to talk about something in CSS, it fundamentally means it's going to be specific to the domain. And so I think these are terms we can really embrace as CSS programmers. <clears throat> OK, definition. A CSS algorithm is a well-defined declaration or set of declarations that produces a specific styling output. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Keywords here are well-defined and specific. And I think the way to tell like, what is an algorithm versus not an algorithm is kind of like how you feel about the CSS. So there's kind of CSS you write where you're like, OK, like font family this, like blah, 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 maybe some kind of mindless CSS. And then there's CSS you write that you're like, oh my god. This is so cool what this is doing. Like, I can't believe this, too. Like, I can see all the stuff that's happening, especially when you start to understand how a browser works. And you can see that what's really happening with our declarative code. It's incredible. So you know what this is. Like, we all know what a CSS algorithm is. And if you've written CSS, you've seen stuff like this. So let's look at a few, few examples here. Does anybody know this algorithm? Clear fix. This is more like a hack. But it was one of the first things that came to mind. I was like, oh, the OG CSS algorithm. And I was like, that's not that fun. OK, another one, positioning. So I think of this as an algorithm. This is a pretty long class name, but it's very descriptive. So if you have, <laughs> if you have a, a, parent, a parent container that's positioned relatively, and you have a child of that parent box, no matter, what, no matter how deeply nested that child is, it, it'll stick to the bottom right of the closest relative parent, which is so cool that we can, like, I don't know, I'm picturing this like cool inception thing where it's like, whoa, fed the bottom corner. OK, anyways, I like positioning, I guess. Amazing, elegant, cool. This is kind of hard, a tricky thing to understand when you're learning CSS initially. How about this one? Lobotomized owl selector. This is a very useful little algorithm. So let's get, this can be really nice, a nice way to kind of select, uh, select content that's in, a, in a, a stack without having to go through um, and doing it manually. Or this. This is a little responsive flu uh, fluid typography algorithm where we're using a viewport unit to adjust a base size and then kind of capping that base size with a media query. Or of course, CSS grid. Oh my god. This can make so many grids. Like, if I can write a few classes like this, this can make all of the grids. This is so cool, so great. So I'll see this algorithm. A well-defined declaration or set of definitions. OK. Another definition we could use, it might be a little, a little less open, but more interesting. A CSS algorithm is a utility pattern that lets the, algor the browser algorithms do the work. And. I think part of writing CSS algorithms is seeing CSS as programming and acknowledging it as such and kind of following best programming practices where we can. So I want to talk about a couple of those. First, 
the single responsibility principle. Here are some kitchen tools. The wooden spoon is so good at being a wooden spoon. The whisk is great at being a whisk. The spatula is great at being a spatula, knife, knife, etc. What about this tool? Does anybody know this tool? This is a spork. Sad. Sporks are not that useful. You're trying to do too much spork. You're doing too many things. So that's one I think we can think about. Another is the notion of small, well-named functions. So people get pretty dogmatic about this small function thing. I'm kind of becoming one of them. But small, well-named functions are really good. So we don't, we're not writing functions in CSS, but our classes are kind of like functions and how we, how we package up our different display functionality and layout functionality. So how small should this function be? Small. <laughs> and then smaller than that. So these are the words of someone named Robert C. Martin, who is one of these like old school agile software development advocates um, in a book called Clean Code, which is all, all the examples are in Java. Um, and so it takes some mental effort to connect them to CSS, but it's definitely possible. So how small, small, good. In the real world, probably not writing the next clear fix. So in our, in our actual projects at work, like how do algorithms relate to this? So we can see cool things in code, on, in code pens, et cetera, stuff you look at and you're like, I don't really understand that, but like, that'd be great to use, I guess. I don't think, see myself writing that really. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk about my work a little bit. Uh, and I am a design engineer, fancy job title, at a company called PMC, Penske Media Corporation. And we're a big publisher, so we have like 24 different brands, like very high traffic websites, and all on WordPress. I love WordPress. And sometimes I call myself a design ops engineer. And the situation of front end at PMC was very interesting before I started. Uh, let's look at some hearts here. I really like my job. They're very supportive of the stuff I'm doing. Um, also known as the design systems are. I feel like a lot of times when you see titles like design engineer, UX engineer, UX developer, whatever, it kind of means like you work on design systems. Also could mean the first and only front end developer. How many of you are in this position at your companies? Right here? A couple, couple? Okay. This is like a very special position to be in. So it's it's kind of difficult. But um, yeah, so there's a team of like 30, 30 engineers and I started all this design systems work, and I'm really excited to say, not anymore. So we recently hired another front-end developer, and I'm like, yes, it's working. So this is a little cute creature <laughs> that is the embodiment of our design system that is called Larva. <laughs> and I'm not going to go into that, that story at the moment, but I think of Larva, this little design system, as kind of an embryonic design system, because the point um, where our company is, where PMC is, we can't really commit to having actual components yet because there's that language between design and development is not synced up, and we don't really know what those components are going to be. So it's kind of my, Larva's been kind of my uh, laboratory. This is our design system. <laughs> this is in, inside a WordPress theme. So we had this project recently called Deadline. That was a, a big pr uh, redesign, and it was kind of this uh, design system's big bang, this big project build out. This is a modified uh, ITCSS structure that's kind of nested into the assets directory. And so the task now is to bring all of that code into a shared code base. Uh, but at the beginning of the project, I created this directory for algorithms. And I was like, how is this going to pan out? Like, is this going to be a useful thing to have at all? And it was. There's like 20 something algorithms in there. And so this served as a really useful naming convention. I'm going to look at a couple of them. So A glue, using this A namespace for algorithm. And each, each algorithm has a little uh, CSS file and an HTML file with some documentation. So glue is positioning. It's a different name for it, but it's something that people, like the back-end engineers who don't know CSS as well, can understand. They're like, oh, I, like you glue something to another thing. Like, okay. So it adds this layer of knowledge that can kind of help people um, pull CSS into their mental model. And this is what it looks like in the design system. So we added a lot of, um, added some custom properties to kind of make it a little more robust, a little more flexible. Um, and this was used like 15 times in one of the last projects, and not just by me, which was really cool. So I was like, oh, wow, this could work. Another one, Space Children. <laughs> That's a funny algorithm name. They're also documented in the pattern library. Um, this is the lobotomized owl. 
And we have, again, kind of expanded this a little more to make it uh, a bit more robust uh, with some progressive enhancement. So when column gap is supported, we can use uh, that, that kind of spacing instead of margin. And here's how this looks. So we have a lot of CSS utilities. And all of the na any names you see here, like C heading, any component name, art article sidebar, those are kind of like testing out the naming. So we're like feeling out, like, would this work? Is it safe to attach CSS to this? And the answer so far has been like, no, keep it in utilities. I like to think of this, oh, so here's the algorithm, different spots. And I like to think of this as like an onion, onion. So you're kind of like layering in uh, different algorithms or different styling. Algorithms can also be useful for the types of designs you see where you're like, what is this designer? <laughs> or like, it's not, not something I have yet. Like, we don't have this in our system yet. Like, this is pretty, but like, uh, how am I going to fit this in? And so the solution has been like, oh, well, I'm just going to like create an algorithm. I don't know what else this is going to be, and I know it's going to show up somewhere else. So create a very long name, but small, well-named function specifically for these border styles. <clears throat> Okay. How to write a CSS algorithm? Or realize you don't need to. <laughs> Turds. Okay, <laughs> careful. <laughs> um, okay, how do you write an algorithm? Well, how do you write an algorithm in an interview? <laughs> uh, well, you start by planning. You do some planning out on a whiteboard. You write a brute force solution. So a not, very, a not performant version of whatever you're trying to do, but probably accomplishes the task, but might be slow. And then you do a walkthrough, where you step through exactly what the algorithm is doing, and like, does this make sense? Um, is this working? And then you would optimize the solution by layering in different algorithm design patterns. What about CSS algorithms? What are our steps for writing a CSS algorithm? Well, they're the same, because <laughs> it's an algorithm. <laughs> okay. But we can break this down a little bit more. So same, same concept, though. Uh, but we do need to do some pre-work, which is turd check. OK, so like before, when you sit down, you're like, I'm going to write a CSS algorithm. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm excited. And you can think, like, should I really be writing new CSS at this point? Like, why, why am I writing this new CSS? Am I, build, am I actually building out a new feature that does not exist? Or am I overriding things that are problematic? Am I compensating for, some, for a framework um, that isn't working well for our company? So step one, plan, pseudocode boxes, and define your problem. So I'm a big fan of drawing boxes on paper. Does anybody else do this before you start writing CSS or building UI? Yeah. So there's research that shows that humans are able to recall things better by drawing them on paper versus typing or drawing on a tablet even. And I found this incredibly helpful. And, and to print out designs, too, because then I can look at them and say, like, oh, I know this, this, and this is accounted for already. And I figure out exactly what CSS I need to write. <clears throat> then we can go to our brute force solution, which is spaghetti. This is, the sa this is when you're supposed to write spaghetti. Because remember our, <laughs> remember our assumption, all code is crap at first. I resisted the urge to put poop in the spaghetti. <laughs> um, so all code is crap at first, so don't write it in the actual style sheet. This is a big takeaway here. Like, you can write a brute force solution for sure, but find a different place to write it that's not your actual code base. Because if you get it working in your code base, you're probably, I mean, if I'm thinking about myself here, very well I might leave it there. So I started creating this file, this little SAS file called scratchpad.scss, which is enqueued uh, or built, added to the build step for the pattern library, but not on the production site. So safe space for poop. And then code some boxes. Like, figure out, your, figure out exactly what you're trying to do. Um, you can do this in a, a pattern library or a static site builder. Also, CodePen is built for this exactly. This is our little, uh, an example of the CodePen for that border situation. And then do your walkthrough. So like, web developers, we love resizing the browser. So like, make sure it works. Um, test it in other browsers and devices. And do it now. It's easier to do it now than to do it when you're actually deploying the code. Well, definitely you should do it before that. <clears throat> is, ask yourself, is every declaration I've written essential? Do you have stray width 100% or stray position relatives, the kind of declarations that you plop in there to try your usual you know, X number of things? Are there any dependencies? Why are they there? And smaller. Make our function smaller. OK, then we can optimize. 
and refactor and document. And this is when our poop can morph into a beautiful flower. Yes, this is how it works, everyone. OK, part of this optimization step. So this is, our, this is a, a real thing from, from the design project, um, where I have my boxes that I pseudo, I figured out exactly my layout and added it to the actual code base. Um, and cleaned up the code a lot on the way. So also documenting these little algorithms to let people know what's going on in the code base. Because if they see a directory called algorithms in your SAS folder, they're going to be like, what is going on? Turd-driven development. No. Let's say no to turd-driven development. And let's think about test-driven development. With CSS, like, could this, this work? Like, this, is, this process and like, this flow of planning things out writing something bad and then going back and, -op and optimizing it, that is test-driven development. So we start with a failing test. Maybe it's a little piece of our design. And we run the test with our eyes. That's just how it works. Write some code. Refactor the code. And this refactor step happens naturally when you're integrated in integrating it into the actual code base. Because you have to change what that code looks like. When you apply your system conventions, et cetera, that will happen at this point. <clears throat> Then, of course, you know, test fails, so and so, and we have our beautiful flower. Yay! The missing piece, refactor. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's not like, OK, sure, maybe the code will morph into a flower. But we have to remember that less formed poop is great, better than regular poop. OK, so I want to show a little experiment. Um, because I'm like, oh, I'm giving a talk. I'm going to show this new thing I'm working on. So test-driven development. I'm really into this. Uh, I've been writing a lot of JavaScript lately in these like, little node scripts. And I've been forcing myself to write tests first. And there are like, incredible things that happen when you write tests. Can we write unit tests for CSS? So I'm writing all this, this node. And I'm like, I want to feel like this about the CSS I write. Like, Why can't we do this? Domain-specific declarative unit tests. And over the past like, week or so, I kind of figured out a way we could potentially do it. And I wrote some very enthusiastic blog posts. So warning, I'm about to show a slide with a ton of code on it and subject to change. But I think that this is maybe what a unit test could look like for CSS. kind of explain what's happening here. So this is the this describe method, and then followed with these it methods are a convention in a lot of JavaScript test suites. But we're using the same idea. So you write a small sentence about what, what your algorithm should do. So this is for the space children. We're supposed to space children here. It should not apply a space above the first child, above the first item. So I assert the positioning of the boxes. Like CSS is boxes, so you test the rendered boxes. And similarly, spaces children. And I do a little bit of math to figure out um, how, where the space should be here. And then these methods will log feedback to the console. So a unit test version of this could potentially look like here. So we have our, the bare minimum HTML, and it's logging the feedback to the console. <clears throat> and then this could also be an integration test on an actual application. And this is where I was like, wow, this could really work, maybe. Because on, on Deadline, on our kind of Big Bang Design Systems project, um, there's a section that's like, this is failing. And I was like, what? what's going on? Why is this failing? So obviously, didn't round the numbers here. But it's like, oh, there's 30 pixels of space below the last item. Why is that there? And this should not be here. This is space added with a margin. And this should be the responsibility of the parent element. And this is something that will bite us later, as soon as someone adds another element to that sidebar. And I was like, whoa, this could be really powerful. Because there's so much, so much in CSS that's extremely intuitive. After you've written a certain amount of CSS, you're like, I know that will be a bad idea. And that's really hard to pinpoint in code reviews. And it's really hard to teach that, too. And so I'm like, maybe these tests could be something. I don't know. And then the, the inner critic in me is like, over-engineering much, Lara? <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> How long did you spend working on this? <laughs> but then I'm like, no, this is bad. Like, we can't do this anymore. And CSS, a lot of the stuff we do is the same as what kind of general software has been doing for a long time. Like, general software development has figured out this turd situation as much, I mean, 
there's a lot to still figure out, of course, and there are many turds across all code bases. But there's a lot of different strategies we use to handle this stuff. So object-oriented, agile, design patterns, et cetera. And on the other side, we have front end. And we have things like design systems, atomic design, progressive enhancement, IT CSS, suit CSS, uh, all, the, all these things. Um, and a lot of this is really similar. A lot of these concepts are the same, but we've kind of layered in the language of design um, into what we're calling these things. Testing, I think we could do more of this. I think this could be cool. Oh. Conclusion. OK, let's have a small story time. <clears throat> OK, <clears throat> how the math hater became a programmer. Let's rewind to 2003. This is little baby Lara, 14 years old. I hate math. Can anybody, did anybody else feel like that growing up in school? You're like, I hate math. Wow, not too many math haters. OK, a few. Um, I loved art class and horses and Green Day, but I didn't put that in the slide. <laughs> 2009, here's Laura, a little bit older. I had some blonde in my hair and some large glasses at the time. 20 years old, in art college, so I went to art school. I had an idea for this weird video game, and I learned how to code because I had a lot of freedom at school and very supportive parents. I ended up kind of getting out of the art thing and, and getting into freelance, freelance development and building a lot of WordPress sites. And in 2015, there was this moment where I was like, I kind of wanted to get a job. And so I started interviewing for jobs. And I wrote this article for CSS Tricks about one of my interviews where I was asked FizzBuzz in the interview, which is a very beginner's, beginner's algorithms question. Um, and I kind of I kind of hit like nine out of ten things on the job description, and this interview was like, "What's going on? This is weird. Like, I don't I don't know this." <clears throat> so I wrote this post for CSS Tricks, and kind of later later that night, this was reposted and retitled on on Reddit on our programming. Designer applies for JS job, fails at FizzBuzz, and then writes five page rant about job descriptions. <laughs> I was like, wow, missing the point. Like, <laughs> that's not OK. Like, OK, Reddit. And so after that, I was kind of like, oh, no. Like, no. I do HTML and CSS. Computer science, not for me. Like, fuck those guys. Like, no, thank you. I don't care. I don't need fizz buzz. Like, no. HTML and CSS, that's what I do. I am not a programmer. I write HTML and CSS. So late 2017 comes around, and I ended up getting another interview that I was really excited about. Um, and it was a whiteboarding interview, and there were going to be legit algorithms questions. And I was like, god damn it, now I really have to learn computer science. So I kind of sat down and did this boot camp for myself um, and learned a lot of computer science fundamentals. I definitely failed the interview, but I learned a ton of stuff. And I realized. Like, computer science is definitely for me. I love this stuff. This is really cool. And it opened my eyes about how the browser works. And I saw all of these connections between the, the CSS and HTML that I was writing and the computer science concepts I was learning. And so I wrote, uh, started the original Algorithms of CSS talk, kind of about this bridging this gap between CSS and computer science. Um, and I realized during that time, I was like, whoa, CSS, this is so cool. And this is not the right metaphor this is the right this is how it is so css is part of this larger picture of computer science and so we must end this section with fizzbuzz in css <laughs> absolutely so 2019 now we're in 2019 and this question is blank a blank this is a, like a messed up question a messed up sentence structure so is CSS a programming language? Let's replace what's in these blanks. Is depression a treatable illness? Is non-binary a gender? This is a culture smell. Because when you ask a question like this, it opens it up for people to say no. And sometimes they say no to things that are yes. So what's going on here? Like, What's going on in our industry that there are 
designers at companies that are working on design systems that can't get anything through because HTML and CSS are not considered part of engineering. So their company won't hire UI developers. Why is that happening? Why are there full stack graduates from boot camps that don't know what the cascade is? Like, what, what's happening? And so I was explaining this situation to someone in my co-working space who was like an old school computer science person. And I was like, why, why, why don't people see CSS as programming? Like, what's happening? And he's like, well, Laura, there's an 800 pound gorilla in the room and it's called testosterone. <laughs> and I was like, okay, dick from my co-working space, got it. Like, this is the truth. There's no, there's not like some, some layered explanation to why, like why people don't see CSS and HTML as programming. It's just, it's a, it's a culture smell. And I think this is bad and we need to change this because CSS and HTML are extremely powerful. So I see them as this golden springboard of languages that can get all kinds of people into programming, into technology. So me, for example, anybody who doesn't have a computer science background or who, who doesn't have the, the confidence of the average white male, CSS and HTML can be these, these kind of entry points into the world of technology. And if we embrace them as programming, like who knows what all these people can do. So, yay. But not just for people that look like me, like everybody can learn from HTML and CSS. And this is a monster because I'm not very good at drawing people, but creativity, like maybe HTML and CSS, if we kind of embrace them as programming languages, say, yes, this is programming, come learn more. Maybe we can have more creative problem solving, et cetera. So the golden springboard, like how about that? Oh, thank you. <laughs>